Hi, welcome to the second episode of a fireside chat with Convince Me Audio. In this episode, we're going to cover the basics of high-end audio, some of the terminologies, what equipment you should buy, what price point should you be looking into, and most importantly, how to get a better idea of what you like. Let's begin. The high-end audio hobby is just like any other hobby. If you're not careful, it will consume your wallet. So it's best to know where to start from. I mean, let's take your starting point as the same starting point as every consumer out there. You have a pair of AirPod Pros, you have an AirPod Max if you're lucky, or you have a pair of Bose and Sony's or a pair of Buds that was provided to you in the box of your phone and your content. But now you want to experience what else is out there. You, maybe you actually went to a friend's house and you heard their system and it blew your mind. Or maybe you just thought, there must be a little bit more to this. I want the thump of a club bass in my house. I want to feel the vibrance of a live orchestra at home, or I want to hear what the artist intended in the studio. We say here on Convince Me Audio, the best place to start is always at the beginning. But if you don't know what the beginning is, there's a tendency to get lost. Especially if you've done the worst thing, sometimes it is the best thing. Jumping into some forums and say, I have this budget, I've never owned hi-fi equipment, what headphone should I buy? And by the time you're done, I can promise you, your head will be spinning, your budget would have been way off the mark, and you were more confused than when you first started. So let us simplify this process. Inside your headphones, let us take the Apple AirPod Pros. They are synonymous, everybody knows what they are, and they're the simplest thing to understand on a surface level. There's a driver which makes the noise, a digital to an analog converter which converts the digital data of a FLAC, MP3 or WAV file into its audio form and then there is an amplifier inside the earbuds that increases this tiny conversion into a louder conversion and then that gets passed on to the drivers which increase and reproduce what that amplifier is telling it to, and that's where you get the song. So the first stage is by separating these, by taking all of these and taking it out of the equation so they're not all smudged in together. Let us unpack the sandwich. We have bread, we have chicken, we have salad, and we have the sauce. Here, we have the DAC, we have the amplifier, we have the driver, and we have the source, which in this case would be your phone. Maybe you're asking why? Why separating these components that this tiny little device, the AirPod Pros, has all in it? Why do I need to separate it? Because these devices that we mentioned, the amplifier, the DAC, and the drivers, everything's been miniaturized to fit into a very small place. And by doing so, there have been a lot of corners cut. There has to be. There has to be some give and take when you're squashing all of these down. If you look at the desk on our left, you can see these humongous racks of units. These are exactly those little tiny parts we talked about, the DAC, the amplifier, and the drivers. We have separated individual units. Now we have left the territory of the consumer market. We have separated and isolated the source, which is usually your phone, your PC, your laptop, the amplifier, and the digital to audio converter. This brings us to the next stage. 
which is the manufacturers concentrating wholeheartedly on the DAC, a separate manufacturer, or it could be the same manufacturer concentrating on just the amplifier, the same manufacturer or another manufacturer concentrating on your drivers, which in this case would be your speakers, earbuds, or in-ear monitors, also known as IEMs, or your speakers, or your headphones. By providing a better digital to analog converter, which can do the job better than the tiny one that's in the AirPod Pros, by providing an amplifier which has more power that plugs into the wall, therefore has more voltage and far more intricate, yet of the same design parts, but with vastly more power, and we have the headphones, which are tuned differently to general consumer grade levels. Let us discuss the consumer sound versus the audiophile sound. The consumer grade sound usually is a V-shape, which basically means elevating the bass region, elevating the treble region to give it more energy and excitement and reducing the mid-range most of the time. This is where the vocals, rhythm guitars, certain instruments bound in this region are pushed back a little bit to give a bit more of an open space and the thump of the bass and the treble of the detail for an exciting listen. Audiophiles usually go after a balanced, sometimes neutral sound. There can be deviations, which we will get onto in a moment, but most of the time they are looking for the correct sound, for the balanced sound, which is basically the bass region, the mid-range and the treble climbs at a consistent rate all the way up as steady a line as possible. This is oversimplifying, but at least you will get an idea of what they are looking for. Before we get onto the sound, let us discuss some of the terminologies that gets thrown around on audio forums in regards to audio and on channels such as this one. The first one you will hear a lot is timbre. Timbre refers to the characteristics of the instrument sounding as real to life as possible. Does it have good timbre? Does it sound realistic? Can you compare it to an instrument from a shop? The next one you will come across is texture. What does this mean? This basically implies the same thing it would do in real life. What is the texture of this suit you're wearing? What is the texture of the material? And we can apply this to sound too. Can you hear the texture of the skin of the drums? The texture is audible. It's tactile. It's bringing to life that real instrument we discussed in a audiosonic form, but your brain feels as though it can detect the texture as if you're touching it. We refer to a flat frequency response. Let's first of all take the frequency response. A frequency response is the sonic wave from the low notes to the mid notes to the high notes, usually around 20 hertz of the human hearing all the way up to the 20 kilohertz of the human hearing. This is referred to as a frequency. And as a rule, the frequency response refers to this. The bass region, mid range and treble are self-explanatory. Then we get into the realms of tonal balance, which basically means, does the sound sound cohesive? Is the bass and the mid range and the treble working in harmony together? Is there any one of those areas that's slightly more forward or back or louder or softer than the other? Then these sorts of areas do get rather convoluted. Things like bloated bass, which basically means bloomy. It becomes overly large and hides other parts of the sound. And then you get things like treble forward, which basically means it comes forward. It's a little harsh. There is an entire language to describe audio. And unfortunately, it's not consistent. Tonal balance, timbre, texture, 
frequency response, treble, mid-range and bass, sub-bass, but these are rather consistent in the hobby. Now you've got a vague idea of what we're talking about, let's move on to the sound. An audiophile is searching for the holy grail to get a performance that is as close to live or as close to the studio as they possibly can. Obviously, this is almost impossible most of the time, but we can get very close. Remember, the geometry of the room makes a big difference. How sound reflects and bounces in a room sounds different in my room compared to your room. How the band was recorded in a room, to a large hall, to a stadium, makes a massive amount of difference, yet it's still the same band playing the same song but due to the surroundings and the environment and how many people were there, whether it was echoey, it makes a big difference. This is also not counting how the engineer mixed it because they can mix on the fly, add a bit of bass, add a bit of treble, like we mentioned earlier, to bring a nice balanced sound. That's what we're searching for, a balanced, good timbered, good textured source that is as close to the studio work as possible. Let us move on to how you connect all of these dots together once you have your system on the desk. So, you decided to separate everything like we discussed. You have the DAC on the table, you have your laptop, you have your amplifier, and you have your headphones and a bunch of cables. The first thing you do is turn on your laptop, then you connect your DAC, which separates the brain work behind dissecting all the data into an analog form from the laptop to the DAC. This is usually connected via a USB cable on laptops. The USB goes from the laptop to the DAC. Then that DAC gets connected to the amplifier via two types of cables. Either a RCA cable, the ones you have on the back of your telly and your old VCR and your Skybox or your old stereo. RCA is very widely used in the consumer market. The next one is a balanced cable, which is an XLR. And this is more of a professional application. This looks like the cable up here. It has three pins and there are two of them. You connect the DAC XLR out to the amplifier XLR in, and then you connect your headphones to the amplifier. Now, you can go from the RCA, which is the single-ended, we will get onto single-ended and balanced for another episode, but for now, you can connect your headphones, your DAC, your amplifier, and your laptop all together in a cohesive form to form a chain. A chain like this is where most of your money will be consumed because you get a better DAC, a better amp, a better laptop. Then you isolate the DAC from the laptop and then the rabbit hole gets deeper and deeper and deeper. But that is a quick summary of how you connect all of the equipment you have chosen. Finally, now you have learned a little bit about how to form a chain, how do you choose what headphones are good for you? How do you choose the right amplifier? How do you know what you even like? All very, very, very important questions you need to ask yourself. And the first one is, what is my budget? How much am I willing to spend? And I promise myself I will not exceed this amount no matter what anybody else says. You have to be firm about this because the rabbit hole is very deep. Let's say you have set yourself a nice goal of $500. I mean, an AirPod Max you might own, or you might own a Sony or a Bose, which have already cost you $350. So you're not too worried about spending money up in this range. We will set a budget of 500. This 500, you first of all divide by your equipment. You will grab your DAC and amplifier, such as a Zendak, which basically has the DAC and amplifier together in one unit. Yes, I know we said we want to separate it, but when you get into this category away from the general consumer market, 
the concentration that has been done on the amplifier and the DAC is far higher so you get a much 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 better performance than what was inside the AirPod Pros. Or you can get an Atom stack where the DAC and the amplifier are separate which will cost you about $250. Magni and Modi from Shit will cost you around $300 as well. The best thing is to actually look on the audio used market because audio equipment you will find lose their value tremendously. So you will find some fantastic deals for equipment that would normally cost you three, $400 for about $100, $150. You'll pick your amplifier, you'll pick your DAC, but the most amount of money should always be spent on your headphones, either your IEMs or your speakers. There are a bunch of fantastic headphones that are pretty cheap that sound absolutely incredible out at the moment, like the Keto IEM, which is around $179, or the KPH40i on-ear headphones, which is around $40, or the KSC75, which is around $20, and you can put these on that chain we mentioned and still get an incredible, incredible result that far exceeds the AirPod Pros as an example as a consumer grade headphone. So there are plenty of audio equipment to be had for this $500 price point that will give you a far, far better audio performance than the general consumer market. These examples I have given you are one of a few, one of thousands that have sprouted in this lower tier category of audiophile equipment. If you have any questions, please put it down below and I'll get to you as soon as I can and explain the best I can. Or you can join us over on Telegram, on the private Telegram chat on Patreon, where I can answer you via voice, discuss your chain, how to build your chain and what to look out for. Or you can jump in the public Telegram chat of CMA and I will get to you when I can. I hope you have enjoyed this episode of a fireside chat with CMA. I will see you in the next one. Peace. This thing won't switch off.